I don't know what it is, but I'm feeling like I've got a little extra pep in my step. I'm feeling a little bit like. Welcome back to another edition of Severance Theories. In episode seven, we will examine a bunch of interesting theories I've come across around the net, Discord, and a few other places. I've got spicy season two news you may not have heard yet. Another massive theory related to Gemma, and we're gonna discuss the ideographic cards Dylan Yoink from OND and Milchik's response to that. And stay tuned to the end because I've got some news related to future videos for the channel you might like. We've got a lot to cover, so let's begin. But before I start, I do need to sound the alarm. Spoilers are incoming if you don't want that spoil for you. Now's the time to hit the save to watch later button come back when you have a chance. I'll still be here. Videos will still be here. Don't worry. It is my pleasure to welcome these fine people to the list of fully integrated innies. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Vani V, Sean H, Luna Cascade, Alyssa Shelton, Margie, and Mandy Cat. Thank you so much for your support. Look for your name in the credits going forward. Oh, what? Oh, I'm sorry. What? Oh, this? Oh, this is just some artwork that a member of the Discord, Sam Sepio, sent to me as a gift. I'm rocking it on my phone as I speak. Just wanted to give him a shout out. Appreciate it much. Which leads me to the point that we have a Discord. It's free to everyone. It's a cool place to find other fans of Severance and shows like it. Check the description box if you're interested in finding out more. All right, so that's it for intros. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of things. Tinfoil tight. All right, let's dive. According to a few credible sources, the word on the block is that Severance season two is rumored to be coming out in October, October of 2023. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 10, 2023. That's a whole eight freaking months away. What are we going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to do for eight months. Eight months? I can't wait for eight months. In the meantime, I've got some info that should give us some idea of what the focus of season two will be about. This is according to Erickson and Stiller across several interviews. In an article in Yahoo News, Stiller, in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, sat down and was quoted as saying this. In season two, we're going to be showing all of these people on the outside and that similar to Mark, they had their own reason for getting this procedure and they're all at some stage of a healing process for one thing or another. So proof that we will be getting the backstories on the rest of the MDR crew. I don't know if we're getting all of them in one season, but we're gonna be getting more information about Dylan, probably Irving, as maybe even Helly and her backstory and what's going on with her Audi. Patricia Arquette chimes in and she says to expect season two to be wilder and scarier than season one. In a quote taken from IndieWire, she's quoted as saying, Patricia Arquette has a sinister warning for a Severance fans. The Emmy winning actress teased that audience should be very scared of what's in store for Lumen employees in the upcoming season two of the Apple original series. Be scared, very scared, according to Entertainment Tonight. No, I think these guys have been working really hard and come up with a lot of really creative things. They have a whole world in their minds. They just let us in piece by piece into what's going on, but I think it will be fun and beautiful. So that's what she has to say about it. She doesn't have all of the details of season two, but she, I guess she has an idea of where things are going and she seems pretty positive. <laughs> One thing she said that I really liked was she said, referring to season two and the answers, that you'll get it when you get it and you won't get upset. Are we sure that was Patricia Arquette talking that? That sounded like Harmony Cobell to me. I don't know. You're going to get these answers and you're going to like it. Cobell channeling that angry mom energy again. While answering some questions about what to expect when it comes to season two, executive producer and co-writer for the show, Ben Stiller had this to say. He also promised season two will provide answers. By the end of season one, there's so many questions that were brought up, Stiller says. As an audience, you're wanting those answers. And I think for us, it's about being able to make something that's satisfying enough for the audience that they feel like a lot of these questions are dealt with, if not answered completely, or some of them are, some of them aren't. On the same subject, show writer Dan Erickson also gives us a little more on what to expect from season two in this quote when he sat down for an interview with Esquire. There's definitely going to be some expansion of the world, Erickson told Esquire. Within Lumen, we're going to see more of the building and we'll see more of the outside world too. Now, Erickson did have something to say about Mark and Jenna, which I thought was really interesting. And I'm very surprised that this is the first time I'm coming across this, but this changes a lot for me. He says that there's a question of sort of who was targeted first. There is a question of sort, is that right? Of sort? Anyway, of who was targeted first? Was Mark targeted because of his relationship to Gemma or was it the other way around? And that's something we don't see this season, but we will in subsequent season. That's the big question. What is special about Mark? Indeed, what is special about Mark? This is huge in my opinion. This is interesting because Erickson reveals that they, Gemma and Mark, are being targeted by Lumen or were. And it isn't just happenstance that these people end up working for Lumen, most likely. We just don't know who Lumen was really targeting, if not both of them. What this does prove is that Lumen manipulates people into making them think that it's their own idea to work for them. 
somewhere right now where Christopher Nolan is smiling. I think this is also true of Peg Kincaid in the Lexington letter. I think she was chosen to work at Lumen and not the other way around. Let's not forget that she also died in a car accident while on the run from Lumen goons. This piece of information sets off a firestorm of ideas and theories because of the implications, which conveniently segues into my next topic. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump straight into this. How do we know Gemma wasn't already severed and Mark had no idea? I know, right? I, I, I didn't think about this before. This is a premise put forward by another creator in this video here. It'll be linked in the comment section. But for the sake of time, it basically suggests that very idea that there's more to Gemma than we might think. Shout out to Harry Lamb for linking this to me in the Discord or I might've missed it. Here's the thing. We know for sure that Gemma, like Mark, was a professor. They worked at the same institution. Her expertise was in Russian literature, I think. I hope I'm right. But it's also possible that Gemma could have been working for Lumen, and she could have been tasked with bringing Mark in to MDR somehow. It's possible that she changed her mind and decided to go against Lumen, and that's why it happened. Or maybe the whole thing was just an accident. Who knows? I may have to make an entire video dedicated just to Gemma. I'll see. We might have to do that. But I want to hear what you think about this, because this is about as close to an admission of Lumen's hands being involved in the lives of people who they don't employ as we've seen so far. It's kind of a big deal. I'm still on the fence with this one, though, as far as whether Gemma is an innocent or whether there's more to her or not. I'm kind of hoping that there is more to her. It would be interesting for her to be more than just a damsel in distress. You know, she might be a player in the story and that could be exciting. Maybe when we get more Audi stories from next season, we'll get some clues as to how she ended up in Lumen in the first place. This particular scene, I want to go back to this scene again. This is the OTC scene. We know this one very well. This is the one where Dylan is being grilled by Milchik about where the ideographic card is. Now we know that Dylan pocketed the cards with these violent images on them that look like instructional cards on how to fold someone in three easy steps. And he did this when he visited OND with the rest of the MDR crew. One thing we have not addressed yet is this question. Did Milchik believe that Dylan smuggled the card off the severed floor? It's kind of important. Does this scene prove that he at least thinks it's possible because it's actually not that hard to do? Or because code detectors are fake news? You know how I feel about those code detectors. <sighs> I've become a full on code detector denier at this point. Also, keep in mind that Milchik is the one who found MDR in OND and gave them that look that your mom gives you when you act up in public and you know you're going to get it when you get back home. I mean, it was Boba Fett. I mean, I would do it again if I could. I'll do it today. Seriously, though, we know that the detectors can pick up words and symbols, and these cards have words and symbols. It should have been cake to detect these with the huge print on the back. And yes, I forgot about this scene, too, but Stiller clearly wanted us to see the back of the cards in this shot, as opposed to using the standard over-the-shoulder shot of Milchik recovering the card. So, what can we make of this scene and the fact that Milchik freaked out and actually risked his job to trigger an illegal OTC just to be sure of where Dylan put the precious cards. I only vaguely covered this topic in a previous video, but I think this tells us that MDR isn't being watched nearly as much as they or we think they are. The Panopticon comes to mind. And yes, I just wanted to say that because it makes me sound smart. But seriously, the concept is simple. Create an environment where the subject feels like they're being watched all the time and they will behave like they're being watched all of the time. Religion tends to work that way too. And so does Santa Claus and this guy. But if you can make the prisoner monitor themselves, the jailer doesn't need to watch them every moment of the day. But this does confirm that Lumen is more than happy to use psychological methods to control their constituents. This is just another example of that. I came across a theory on the reddits that suggests that the detectors are in fact real, but they don't detect physical words or symbols, at least not the way that we think that they do. Instead, they are triggered by scanning the chips of severed elevator riders and detecting that the occupant has contraband on them through their recent memories. I know, I had the same reaction. It sounds good at first because it, it solves many of my code detector denial problems. But then I started to think, if the detectors are scanning chips with that level of specificity, there would be no secrets for any any to keep, ever. And that's a bit OP as a story element here. But who knows? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comment section if you are a code detector denier too, and if so, how do we start that Facebook page? Also, what do you think Milchik was thinking when he came for Dylan at the crib? Did he think that Dylan smuggled it out or is he just generally high strung because the card was missing and the card is really important for some reason? And also, what do you think the cards are for? Because I still have no idea. <laughs> I think it's like a card game, like Uno, but you have to do what's on the cards and a loser ends up in the ICU. Okay, that's it for this episode. Many more subjects left to cover before season two begins. We're going to save some for next time. 
So I said I had an announcement to make. Pretty simple. I want you guys to start giving me your theories in the comment section of my videos. Not just this one, but any of them. And if I do see them and I do like what I see, I will use your theory in my next video and you will get credit for it and we'll discuss it and I'll assess it and I promise you I will not be too rough. Donkey! I promise to enjoy all of your theories equally. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know what to do. Praise Kier. Take care of yourselves out there. And until next time, off you go.